Well, if you just move over there in case somebody's late, uh, they can sit here. <laughs> Frank, can you see me over there? Yes. It's always good to take that last look. <laughs> Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Gary Lamb with the Hawthorne Valley Center for Social Research and uh, helping uh, with these activities over these three weeks. Uh, this is the second weekend, there will be another weekend. And uh, key player, uh, supporter, uh, initiative taking this is Nathaniel Williams from the MC Richards program. And uh, this coming weekend, there will be three public performances under the title Rainbows by Invention, a journey in color light. Um, coral light. Coral light. Thank you. Um, and uh, there will be singers, musicians, color light display. And the theme of color lights uh, dates back to 1918 uh, when Rudolf Steiner went uh, and asked. Young student, if he would help him to create a counterpart or alternative to the cinema of his day. And he called it light play art. And uh, Steiner was looking for something that would stimulate the imagination uh, and engage the viewer. So they're kind of co creators, co participants, whereas we're more passive. Uh, individuals with a normal cinema. So it was kind of, and uh, in the back here are uh, sketches done by Jan Stupin um, with the theme Metamorphosis of Fear. Steiner suggested that as the first theme for this new work. Um, and this was shortly after World War I, and the world was quite a bit under the fear at that time. And has never really left humanity since that time. And we're still dealing with this queer question, uh, maybe more so with wars going on and artificial intelligence, anxiety and fear about the future is still pretty prevalent. So the theme, I think, is still warranted. Um, yes, yeah, so getting back to the presentations next weekend. Um, there, um, Nathaniel and composer Don Jamison um, work together and with the MC Richard students um, and Laura and Summer, Frank Agrama, Aldo Biaggi, and a uh, host of community singers who all participate. Those will be on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. The first one is seven o'clock on Thursday. And Friday and Saturday, they're at 5 30. And they're, if your memory is like mine, you need a piece of paper to remind yourself of those. Okay. Um, today, we have a presentation, multiple presentations, short ones, uh, by three artists. And the theme is artistic research, research as art. Um, I'll just read from the flyer. We live in a time of unprecedented outer challenges that reveal an inner need to develop new capacities in individuals and to work on society as a whole. What are these qualities and capacities? Can art play a role in developing them? Can art midwife mobile thinking 
in the place of hardened and mechanistic thinking, inner freedom as well as outer freedom, empathy as well as self assertion. So we have Lori Summer, Nathaniel Williams, and Michael Howard will give uh, short presentations of about 15 or 20 minutes each. And then we're going to open it up for your questions, comments, reflections on what's happening. Uh, anybody want to add anything for the next one? Yes, Bob. We're good to go. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, so we're going to start with Laura Summer and then uh, Michael Howard will speak next, and Nathaniel will finish up the presentation and then we'll be, have a more Oh, uh, conversational mode at that time. Yeah. Are we ready? Okay. So welcome everybody and thank you so much for coming and thank you so much to the people who are all over the world on Zoom. I don't think there's that many of you out there, but I'm really so much that you're there and I know there's somebody in Europe and a um, few other places and I know that the people that I work with who are in um, Malaysia and in India have also asked for the recording of this so that they can watch it for them. It is in Malaysia three in the morning. So um, nice that we have the technology to um, yeah, to welcome people from different places. Um, so, could you speak up? I can try. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I had my painting training, which was about 33 or 34 years ago, um, my teacher said to me, that Rudolf Steiner had said that color and tone are open windows to the spiritual world. And she also told me that Goethe had said that color and tone are different streams, but the same source. This is really fascinating to me. I can't give you the reference of where it is, although maybe my colleagues might be able to do that. Um, but it was, a really, it was really interesting because it didn't make any sense to me. Um, to me, one color was the same as another color as far as feeling went. Yeah, if Joe has a red scarf on, it's red. I can see it's red. Candace has a bluish purple scarf on. That looks different, but it's a retinal experience. And I was really slow at making anything other than a retinal experience of color. And so for quite a few years, my teacher would say, well, blue feels different <clears throat> than red. And I would be like, you know, I didn't want to be a stupid student. So I usually didn't say, I don't know, know what you are talking about, but sometimes I just kind of quietly cry because I just didn't get it. But what I found after I started working with it more and more was that there was this whole realm of quality that had a, um, it was like a world of feeling. But when we think about feeling, we think about it as emotion, like I'm happy or I'm sad. But if I expanded that definition out, I could actually experience that there were different feeling qualities in everything. So in a plant that was just sprouting up and coming into life, there was a feeling there. It wasn't just that I knew that this was different than a dying plant, but I could actually feel it. And so I would say that for my whole life work as an artist, as a painter, I'm always working in that realm 
of quality. It's not like good quality and bad quality. Um, it's not like the stuff you get it discounted because it wasn't as good as something else. But it's this whole realm that you can access, but you have to figure out how to access it. For some of us, and for me for sure, it was a slow journey of figuring out how to access that place in myself that could perceive the quality. So I want to do a little experiment with you. I think that tone, sound, is even more open to people than, than color is. Um, so we're going to do a little experiment, and I have volunteers in the audience ready. <laughs> and so you're going to hear a sound, and then it's gonna, everything's going to get very quiet, and then you're going to hear a different sound. And then you're going to hear the first sound again, and then quiet, and then the second sound. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. You can keep your eyes open if you want. You can close your eyes if you want. Ready? Any questions before we go into this scary experiment? <laughs> okay. So now, there's no right or wrong answers to this. But if I said to you, you must assign a color experience to that first sound. Do you want to hear it again? Okay, let's hear the first sound again. Now you can hear the second sound again. I want the same question. So you can compare them. Yeah. If you've chosen a color for the first sound, you can now compare it. Is it the same color for the second sound? Yellow, orange, and blue. Yellow, orange, and blue. Maggie? I got lemon yellow and that brownie. What is it like a deep orange, reddish orange? Reddish orange yeah. for this. Okay. Martina? Yellow. I had like silvery and yellow mix. And in there, a core of a copper warm color with a purple around it. Um, Phil? Yeah, I got a yellow green and a color and uh, blue, blue red. A little, okay. more, a little more. 
We have Linda online says bright yellow and gold with orange. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Mark? I, I was struck by yellow orange also. And then a, a blue purple almost ultraviolet going down to the invisible mm -hmm. spectrum. Great. That person will you come in or she just you know, uh, she's on the phone. <laughs> so was there anybody that felt that those same that those two tones were the same color they had the same experience with them so that's the open window that's the part of your being that you can perceive something beyond the material and you can begin to expand that place and become more perceptive in that place but everybody has it and that's what he meant that it's an open window you don't have to do a 20-year esoteric training in order to experience the difference in that realm all right we're going to have to move a little faster here so that's where I work all the time is in this realm of quality. And so I do a lot of translation work, which are a kind of research. Like what, what kind of painting would I do for a certain mood experience? And the things I brought for you as examples are these two paintings, which I did. In relationship to two poems by Hafiz. Hafiz was a Sufi poet in the 1300s. And I made a calendar of 12 poems by Hafiz and 12 paintings. This was in 2021. I make a calendar every year. It's really fun to decide what I'm going to make a calendar for. But the first poem that I'm going to read to you is from February, is in the calendar in February. Hafiz didn't say it was from February. <laughs> it probably maybe even wasn't in February where he was, but I had to choose what poem would go with which month, first of all. So you've got a translation there already. And then I had to paint the painting that was in relationship to the poem, but it's not an illustration. So I didn't know what the painting was going to look like when I started, but I had to choose kind of the colors that I was going to work with. And then it's almost as if I enter into a room that the poem has created, and I exist in that room responding to it by painting. So I'm going to read you the first poem. It goes with this painting up here. Don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it cut more deep. Let it ferment and season you as few human or even divine ingredients can. Something missing in my heart tonight has made my eyes so soft my voice so tender, my need of God. So now I'm going to read you the poem from October, and it goes with this painting. That tree, no, I started. Beloved master, that tree we planted near the spot that became your tomb has grown so well that it is now several times my height. 
when the season comes that makes its leaves bow and whirl. Poppies will then sleep upon the ground, hoping in at least a dream, you will kiss my cheek again. So the poem, the painting that shows up, it's like a collaboration between the poem and the materials and me. And that's a really interesting concept. And I think it's research because you have to move into things that are unknown and move them around and not know what's going to happen. To close, I just want to tell you the experience I had yesterday with these sketches, because you might want to, at some point during this exhibit, repeat this experience. I had seen these sketches for quite a while. I had read a little bit about them. I talked to other people about them, but I didn't have a really any strong experiential uh, experience with them. But yesterday, I was in the gallery with my son-in-law and he was looking at the sketches and he said, and he came across this, this thing that you guys know, which is the descriptions of each of the plates as if the, the plates are uh, backdrops for a stage production. So these are the instructions to the people making the thing happen that was in movement and sound. And so my son-in-law said, found this thing. He said, let's read it to each other. And then we can look at the each one as we read this. And each one of these descriptions is like three quarters of a page, not like a couple words. And so we stood here in front of these and it took us about 45 minutes and with handing it back and forth so we could read it. And this amazing thing happened to me, which is that they were still up until then. They were fixed. And then as he would read it, I could imagine it as a moving sound picture. And that for the first time, I suddenly really wanted to see it that way. Up until then, I'd be kind of like, ah, okay, this happened a long time ago. I'm not that interested. Then I was like, whoa, what would it take to actually have it moving with sound? <clears throat> and if you get up close to this later, you can see these. There's like these little tiny things in there. There's like little people and little creatures, and they're very weird. And they would be moving around. And they would be like little like puppets moving and being, and there's the descriptions of them. They have like grotesque faces and expressions and, and yeah, it's, it's gonna be an amazing thing when somebody's old time old That's what I will close with. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Laura. Uh, we have with this all over, and it's going to be very interesting to see where we actually think that are the similar experiences to share and uh, where we differ. So, I look forward to our conversation. So, greetings to all of you. Thank you for coming. Also, to those of you who are online. Um, the context of this gathering is the exhibition of uh, these drawings by young student, and of course the uh, world premiere. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> 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 and having worked with him in the past, I'm uh, very much looking forward to that work. But I think that our so so our traditions today uh, clearly uh, <laughs> relate to uh, this this light art uh, and. Uh, we also have things to say about qualities of color and form. 
<clears throat> but I also want to now <clears throat> put it in a slightly larger context. <clears throat> um, everybody's, now it's obvious to everyone that uh, art is always evolving. The outer appearances of art uh, never stay the same. Um, but it, it follows from, but I, I sense that it's less obvious to people that the work of the artist is also always evolving. Now, clearly, in the way they make the art objects, that um, changes as new materials, new possibilities, new techniques get developed. But what I'm really drawing attention to is that the role of the artist and the interactivity that the artist engages in, and how that uh, affects the culture and the society that they're in, also evolves. It's also constantly changing. And I think that that's where uh, I would like to just uh, draw attention to that dimension because I do think uh, the significance of this light art and uh, even if there are modest beginnings, uh, uh, Nathaniel and his uh, students are working on, it, it actually to me has a high uh, and long-term significance. And so I brought along uh, some of my uh, recent work <clears throat> that I'd like to connect to that uh, but also this larger uh, task of art that I suggest is, is evolving, it's changing today. Uh, that uh, even in my own lifetime, uh, my experience and understanding of art has absolutely changed. You know, uh, I had no idea in my 20s what I would experience and understand today. So I will also try to uh, draw attention to uh, some of the things that I've been working on recently uh, that uh, the work itself doesn't need explanation, doesn't need me to say anything uh, uh, to you uh, to find your own relationship to it. But if we have the question, <clears throat> what is uh, the reason that one artist works the way he does? And also in the time that he's doing it. So why do I work this way? at this time in not just my biography, but in world evolution. And so that's really more what I would like to uh, draw out from looking at this. Um, I uh, have uh, uh, like to play with words and not to, to create labels that then become fixed, but just as a way to uh, think and look uh, at something uh, differently. So I'm gonna uh, introduce three uh, terms. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, being a visual musician. Uh, I'm going to speak about being an artist researcher. And then I also would like to touch on uh, being a cultural activist. Yeah? So these are just focal points for maybe, uh, it's not the words themselves that are important, but, but the, the thoughts and experiences around them. So I would also go back. Uh, yeah, so if you have the question, why do I work the way I do, as you see in these works? I would say that um, it's because I am moved to create visual music. And so to the extent that I'm even just striving to create visual music, yeah, I'm a painter, sculptor, so we speak of a visual artist. But I have reason to say I'm aspiring to be a visual musician. What does that mean? And how do I go about it? And what might uh, its value uh, be uh, for myself, but also for other people at this time? So just briefly to go back, <laughs> uh, I went to art college in Toronto uh, in my um, early 20s. Uh, and um, the assumption at art college was that I was learn there to learn how to better express myself uh, through color and form. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, just a few years later, I found my way to Emerson College mm -hmm. uh, in England. And uh, it was quite striking to me uh, to uh, realize that I was being guided not to express myself, but actually to learn to attend to what color and form and music were 
for expressing to me, to us. So it was turned 180 uh, degrees. And so what I mean by that is that uh, we were invited um, to uh, not just look at the yellow pigment or the clay or wood, but to uh, find a way to live into the yellowness of yellow as opposed to the blueness of the blue. So exactly the same thing that you described, I also met in my early years. And uh, <clears throat> that soon became the foundation of my own artistic work and that of teaching. Uh, so I met it in all of the arts and crafts that were taught at Emerson. <clears throat> but being uh, at that point, mainly a sculptor, uh, I asked myself, well, what is the equivalent? And I was, again, quite struck to realize that every art has its physical elements. Yeah, again, the clay, the wood, the stone. Uh, but uh, the physical material it was not the real work of art. Just like the music is not so much the physical sound, we need the physical sound in order to have the inner experience of the music, even with these simple instruments. And so there also with sculptor, sculpture, I asked myself, what are the basic elements of form? And of course, I quickly realized it was something like uh, roundness and angularity, convex and concave, and several other basic things. And so I was moved to start making little round domes, little concave bowls, little uh, um, plane, two planes meeting at a sharp angle. And I had the question, what do I experience from the convex curve compared to the concave or the angle? And uh, at first, it's like, you don't know, what, what am I supposed to experience? It's not very clear. But it's the repetition that was really the key, uh, because over time, then uh, a certain feeling would kind of uh, dawn a little bit. Uh, and, and again, through repetition, that would grow more clear and vivid over time. And <clears throat> so um, that was the first beginning of, um, uh, you know, I, I, I would like to say that I, I was investigating the qualities of form as they manifested through the basic elements of form. So that then when I created uh, freer forms, I was aware of what elements I was using. And in that way, I was aware of what qualities I was evoking uh, in myself, but presumably in other people, even if they weren't fully conscious of it. And so I said the word investigate the qualities of form because I didn't quite realize it at the time, but uh, later on, I realized that it was at that moment that I began uh, to do research in the realm of form and color. I was not just using these materials to express myself. I really was trying to delve into what this phenomenon was and how it could speak to human beings. Uh, and so that did then lead to several other things that I'll just briefly touch on. Uh, but, but that's where I feel uh, I became an artist researcher uh, with that uh, approach. Um, so, um, when I was at Emerson, we also, of course, did you with me? And as many of you know, uh, there's two aspects to you with me. Uh, the one is movement to uh, sounds of speech, the vowels and consonants in particular, and is often referred to as visible speech, with me as visible speech. And then there is also uh, movement done to uh, 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 music. Yeah, music, and uh, that's called visible uh, music. Uh, and both of those, in the end, had a deep effect on me. Uh, I can't go into all the details, but uh, uh, I, I, I did these uh, movements to the vowels and consonants. And uh, there was one moment, especially where uh, I was just politely uh, copying my teacher and the way they moved. But then she said the sound, ah, and I moved this gesture and I experienced awe-ness. Yeah, it was not in my head, it was, uh, it was resonating through me as a lived reality. 
And so that simple experience was then the beginning of my interest in arrhythmia, even seriously considered doing arrhythmia training. But instead, what happened was <clears throat> that I came across uh, quotes where uh, Rudolf Steiner uh, made clear that the basis of arrhythmia uh, was that there was a qualitative correspondence between the, the quality of speech sounds and certain movements, the quality of certain movements. But he also uh, went on to say uh, in certain lectures that there was also a correspondence with certain qualities of form. So that was a very interesting thought that there could be a correspondence between the qualities of speech sounds, movement, and form. And so I suddenly had the question, well, that seems like a task for a sculptor to see what would a B sound look like as a form? What would an M sound look like as a sculptural form? What would a K look like? And so I uh, had done with me, but then just meditated on these uh, sounds of speech and playfully tried to create different forms. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> uh, it took a long time, I would say, before I felt uh, I got any ground under my feet. But if I just say to you that as a sculptor, I make roundish forms that have a certain quality and I can make angular forms and that has another quality. I'm trying to say what that is. But if I now say the sound A and ask, should that be more curvilinear or angular? And what about M? Should that be curvilinear or angular? Now, I would love to take the time to see what you come up with, but I ask this often enough that I can actually say I've hardly ever met anyone who didn't immediately see the quality of similarity between an angular surface and a cut sound. And that an M is much more soft and fluid, like curves. And so in one sense, that might almost seem self-evident, but I like to point out that that took 10 years of research before that became clear to me, that, that nobody told it to me. And if you got it right away, it's only because I could ask the question in the right way uh, so that it would be self-evident to you. But, but try to imagine this was not evident. The Royal Standard did not give indications about this in particular. So again, that was research that uh, I continue to this day and has led in many different directions. I just brought this one example on the bottom here where uh, I really, on the one hand, uh, am exploring uh, this particular sequence of consonants that Steiner gave here in this called the evolutionary sequence of 12 particular consonants. I won't name them just now, but it was in doing that work that I also felt I got a new insight into the principle of metamorphosis. Uh, and that's uh, so I learned something about uh, metamorphosis by uh, developing the one shape after the other. Uh, and uh, so these have all become an integral and uh, significant part of my uh, works. By the way, you don't need to know what sounds they are to, you know, to experience the metamorphosis. You can just gently try to live into the, say, the first form there and then imagine that transforming into the second and so on. And uh, maybe this would be the place to point out that these are clearly fixed forms on the, the panel. Yeah, they're not physically moving. But the question is, can we learn to uh, live into the forms and the way we live into uh, sound, music, and the way we can live into the colors so that we feel the quality of each form. And then if you can do that, then when you go from one form to the next, you can actually feel the, that these forms are uh, moving and, and uh, transforming from one to the other. So in one sense, you could say these are 12 different forms. And in another sense, you could say it's one form transformed 12 different 
tiles, which are 12 different uh, qualities. And so that is, I think, a significant uh, development in the history of art. That we are trying to work with dynamic qualities of color, dynamic qualities of form, in fact, all the arts. I want to just now though come to this visible music. If you ask me what's behind this, it was this aspiration to create uh, the feeling experience I have with music uh, in graphic or sculptural forms. And it was uh, inspired by realizing maybe 15 years ago that even though I was a painter and sculptor, I had to admit that I was still more deeply moved by music. And that was very annoying to me. I'm a sculptor and painter. Why am I more deeply moved by music? And so that challenged me to uh, research really, how could I find ways of drawing, painting and sculpting that would bring out the more uh, intimate and deep feeling experiences that we can have through music. And so again, that became a source of research uh, for uh, for these 15 years now, and I feel like I am still uh, finding my way. But that is what's behind it. And without going into the individual pieces, of course, there is this thing that I've been starting uh, with black or at least dark browns rather than white. And that came around the same time uh, out of this interest of uh, living and working with darkness. Uh, it actually started shortly after 9-11, and uh, so there was this profound sense of darkness in the world that uh, was surrounding us, and I was not intimidated by it, but really wanted to explore how light and even color arises out of the darkness, and that became very rich and meaningful to me, and then to that I brought this question of how to bring uh, uh, this form into uh, something more dynamic uh, that was uh, going in the direction of um, music. So um, yeah, it would take longer to explain in detail, but I think you can see that with all the forms I'm creating, uh, they uh, again are fixed uh, physically, but um, at least I'm striving to form them in such a way that uh, I, if not other people, uh, experience them as moving forms. The forms are still clear, but they're not fixed and rigid. But in, uh, this is maybe just one moment in time uh, where they uh, had a movement before and they will have a movement after. And this is just the one moment. So <clears throat> that's where the visual music, the visual musician uh, came in, but was also uh, is a uh, field of research. <clears throat> I just want to conclude with this term cultural activism. Uh, and I would say as distinct from political, social activism. And there is certainly a need. The, the, the wrongs, even the evils in the world today are so dire that we cannot uh, wait to try and bring about change. It is more keeping with our true humanity. But I do see a problem that if we only resort to political activism, um, we, in fact, I can just say, you know, I grew up in the 60s and there was all this political civil rights movement, and we had this sense that the world is changing for the better. But in recent years, we have to come to terms with the fact that it didn't change as much as we would have wished it had, uh, that, that the transformation of human nature is a very slow, long process. And so that's where the cultural activism comes in for me. And simply put, it's that I see that the role of the, the, role of the arts and of artists uh, has a new task to awaken and develop artistic capacities in as wide a circle of people as possible in the same way that our present culture and civilization is built on developing scientific capacities in as many human beings as possible. Not so that we have just more science, 
but so that more people can think logically, analytically, and do things in mechanical ways to bring order into human society. And so that is in one sense a great achievement, but by itself is the source of great uh, uh, harm, potentially. And so that's where I see the development of artistic capacities in as many people as possible is the complement, <clears throat> uh, not to replace, but the complement to developing the scientific capacities that we already uh, develop on people. And it is so that human beings, more human beings, will cultivate this qualitative perception. To do that, you have to transform your own sympathy and antipathy. You, know, you didn't ask which color do you like or which sound do you like better than the other. That's our natural relationship to all these uh, artistic mediums is what we like or dislike. But we can transform that to perceive and know the quality. And that's the same capacity that say a teacher you're not going to be a good teacher if you only like some students and dislike others. You have to learn to perceive the quality. We can't avoid it completely, but that's the work, is to learn to perceive uh, the qualities in, in children, but also in each other, our colleagues, in order that we can have new social uh, relationships. And so I would actually suggest that learning to perceive the qualities of color and form and music and so on is a way we school empathy. Yeah? Empathy is the capacity to live into and experience the reality of another person. Some people seem to have that more naturally than others. Some seem to not at all. So if we wanted to foster empathy as a capacity in more human beings, how do we go about that? And so I would say this qualitative uh, schooling, uh, what's I call artistic feeling, through the arts is a way to school empathy in a wider circle of people. And so I won't go into all the details, but I think that there are other capacities uh, that the artists uh, create opportunities for us to develop uh, inner freedom, for example, uh, and the qualitative knowing, which I think is the key to perceiving and knowing soul spiritual realities as we presently know physical. Reality. So that's uh, the vision I have for the task of the uh, artists, uh, learning to perceive these qualities, learning to see uh, static physical forms uh, qualitatively and dynamically. These are all uh, ways that the arts and artists can contribute to what surely are the dire uh, needs of our time. It's not going to be a quick fix. It's really uh, going to be generations, if not centuries, in the making, just as science has been uh, cultivated for centuries now. Uh, but that's what I would like to end with, is just that picture that uh, uh, even if it's not uh, there consciously, when we look at works of art, when we look at these sketches by young students, or when you watch uh, the light art performance of Nathaniel and his students, uh, that's maybe just something to keep in mind that that's not just there to entertain us, but it is to awaken and strengthen these other capacities that I think have far reaching importance in the coming future of human humanity. So thank you, that's it. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I well we it's nice what have been prepared and I'll try not to make it too long. Um my name is Nathaniel Williams, as has already been mentioned. Um and uh I I wanna Shares, I want to kind of come at this through a little bit of a detour of a few anecdotes and just some sharing and just offer something briefly. And um, I want to say, you know, um, I have a similar enthusiasm as Michael for this live play, like the potential of it. And um, so I don't want to, it's very simple what we prepared. It's only like a 30, 40 minute performance this next weekend. But I really hope that if you can, you might make one. Um, 
it's truly a unique and unusual thing that's coming out of our work. And it's very elementary, but um, at the same time, you know, one of the great challenges, you know, especially when you're beginning things, is to do something good with little. Yeah. And so that's a wonderful challenge, you know, to work with very little, but to try to do something with that. It's like the off the, the opposite of computer uh, computer animation. <laughs> okay, not a big computer animation crowd oh, 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 here. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he's over the top with a lot of computer animation. Um, but I have, going last, I have so many things to connect to that Laura and Michael have already brought into the space. But um, okay, so like this morning, I was reading. Um, I, I I like to read Emerson's journals, which you know is kind of the rough human material that crafted his essays out of. This morning I read one of you know there's all these little short entries in there. There was this entry, it said, My boy says the flowers talk when the wind blows. He's growing thin in the summertime and running into eyes and eyelashes. You say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is exactly what, what he said. I wrote, right. But it's uh my my boy says that flowers talk with the wind blows. He's growing thin in the spring and running all into all into eyes and eyelashes. And um, you know, there's I mean, there's so many uh like uh, I mean, like you know, artists. Uh, we all make the artists in this audience, I know. So um, I, I know folks here, but also, you know, I mean, we meet people that we would traditionally, I know art is, I'm not going to go into all the, you know, varieties of art, of course, it would be ridiculous in a short time. But traditionally, like the artist is someone you're not sure you can trust. Also, Plato wasn't sure. You know, they're strange creatures, you know, they can <laughs> pretend to be anything. And uh, you meet, sometimes you meet artists, and when they talk to you, um, you know, that you can just see the level of their participation in your gestures, you know, they're like, they're all in and like, um, just the way you're moving your, your um, body or like the way the sky is, you can feel that they're actually out of their, like, I love this, I don't love this, and feeling this whole orchestra of, you know, experience. And sometimes it's a little disconcerting, you know. I mean, like, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with some of the intimate details of Van Gogh's life. That's one famous example, you know, where there's, you're kind of, they're kind of so far out in the brilliant light that um, this field that has been alluded to opens up. It's just sublime, you know, but also you lose a little bit the anchor of egotism. You know, the whole kind of holds you together, which is one of the blessings of strong likes and dislikes. Mm -hmm. So you know who you are um, as a personality now. <laughs> but um, I, uh, and, and there's no justification needed for, for an artist. You know, there's a joy in creating that is inspired by random encounters, you know, I mean, like, everyone was scared to meet Norman Mailer, the American journalist and novelist, because he might write about it, you know, <laughs> and there's a lot of writers like that in history, you know, they're always looking for material, <laughs> same with caricature artists, you know, like, if you meet the New Yorker caricature artist, be careful, you might want to move to another table, <laughs> um, but there's like, um, I had an experience in the winter, uh, last winter, where I took some slushy, um, you know, uh, snow into my hand, and I, I was just rubbing it with my other hand, and it was a kind of snow, it wasn't like a soft, fluffy plate, but it was like grainy, when I rubbed it against my hand, I could just feel this grit of the ice. And I could, I mean, it was in my, you know, my hand, which was, I, I experienced that so warm so warm compared to that ice. And um, then it's that, that, that pain of the numbing started, right? The longer that I kind of dwell with it, I could feel. And um, 
I could just feel the terror of life. That sounds weird, right? I'm telling you, I'm like, is he okay? He's feeling the terror of life with snow in his hand. But I was feeling the terror of life with him. This, this like angularity that was also pressing out the warmth out of my hand. And then I was just, and staying with it transfixed him. It turns into a pool of water. Mm -hmm. And then it grows warm. And I just, there was, and, and that sounds like a very simple experience to have. <laughs> but when it turned into water and it grew warm, I had a deep experience of optimism mm -hmm. about the human experience. That's just an interesting thing to happen to me. Now, um, you know, when you, we talk about what is the title of the event today, something in the time of fear? Age of fear. Age of fear. <laughs> I came up with it, I think. <laughs> but, um, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, the age of fear today, like, okay, the, the quickest place we could go is, you know, fear really grabs people. Bloody headlines. I mean, anyone who is, uh, you know, it's at the news every other day, every day, whatever. Um, it's good for business because you sell advertisements, right? I mean, you can sell, if you can get more people clicking on things, you can sell to advertisers ads. And uh, that's kind of a, you know, one level of the age of fear that we're in, which I'm just going to talk about, you know, but it's there. But I'd like to just take a step further and, um, that's a whole a kind of um, topic unto itself. But if I take a step further, and this is something that's connected to this whole project um, that Jan Stutt and Steiner were working on 100 years ago. That's um, an experience, like, like for instance, the experience that I have with that, you know, just with a moment of snow in my hand or the experiences of artists that you all were just thinking of that you know in your lives, um, there's something interesting about those experiences because it's like you have an understanding, but if you feel it and it gets you somehow where you feel like your whole person is understanding. And yet what you're understanding, it's like, uh, you know, you feel like you're connecting to some truth, and yet obviously art, we're just creating these delusions, you know, creating illusions, but we feel that we're connecting with truths that are so deep. And, um, I think that the age that one of the the unspoken deepest fears that um, is permeating us, and we're not even really conscious of it, is that those experiences are vacuous and empty. Is that the spirit actually? It's it's an illusion, and maybe for for this crowd, it's not a big deal. But now I'm speaking more generally. You know, I mean, I think it's fair to say spontaneously today, even people who are religious or spiritual, you know, when you imagine the cosmos in existence, you imagine a, a, a kind of infinite physical space, energy and matter. And if you pay attention, there's a, there's some, there's an important feeling when that is created, you know, it might be. My favorite example is when you turn on public radio and you hear this. Boom, boom, star date. <laughs> the emptiness of space spreads out all around you. And there's nobody home. There's nobody there. In fact, we want to find extraterrestrial life really, really, really bad because of this kind of underlying loneliness in this picture. And um, there is a fear that I feel like is kind of that is connected to our modern culture. And I know you spoke a little bit about where we are today. And there's another fear that is a little harder to follow, but I think it's there nonetheless. When you start to experience and ask questions like the ones that have been raised 
in the last hour, such as, wait, did Laura just say that when I pay attention to any experience, and I'm trying not just to relate my sympathy, how I feel, my antipathy to it, that I am going through a window into a spiritual dimension of existence. I think that's what he said. And um, I, I, I feel like we actually, this is kind of the paradoxical thing, is we're scared that actually our most valuable fully participatory experiences are illusions. And yet when we try to go there, we feel the danger of losing ourselves. And unconsciously, we reach for materiality with a kind of un unconscious thrust that is a thrust of fear. Rudolf Steiner one time characterized materialism as a fear phenomenon. In this sense, and I think the fear is somewhat justified. Um, but I, I would like to not just go from a, a different, uh, slightly different direction and then wrap up. Um, <clears throat> you know, when you try to grasp to hold on to these ephemeral experiences of what Laura called the, qual the experiences of quality, which are not, not tangible, they kind of slip between your fingers. You feel like you're you're on a um you don't you can't find solid ground. You know, you feel like you can even feel vertigo um, when you try to really connect with that as your kind of perspective on life. And if you but you know, all of this work here and this project is actually inspired by um, spiritual science, which is was developed by Rudolf Steiner. Um, and really the core of that is, is um, has to do with meditation. So if you don't just approach these things as an artist, but let's say you also approach these questions in meditation. You start to have experiences where um, you notice that there's actually is possible to connect with these areas of intangible areas of experience through intensified concentration. And it doesn't feel like you're walking through a swamp and sinking and getting confused. You can you can you can actually support yourself. And it also appears to you, this is the feeling. How could we ever think that these spiritual experiences arose from matter, given how unbelievably animated and powerful and radiant and creative and intelligent they are, for instance, the experiences you have in meditation? And you start to experience that they are in many places um, all around us. And then if you're an artist, you kind of start to notice that there are different qualities of these inner spiritual experiences that are connected to different kinds of colors. So for instance, if you have a translucent color or a stained glass window, it's, it's connected to a different kind of spiritual experience than an opaque, um, just an opaque turbid color that covers the surface totally. It's not translucent, but it's very distinctive. It's like the difference between a zebra and a donkey. You know, it's like a really, really specific difference. Um, then again, a color that is the radiance of a light source. It's like a light source. It's not having a light source shine through it, but it itself is a source of light. This again, different kind of color. And you might notice things like if light is played by an automated machine, it's different than if it's played by a person. 
You might notice that too. You might notice how that's connected to different kinds of experiences you can also have in meditation. And almost all of our color of light experiences today are automated, meaning fully mechanized machines. Movies, the, all the TV series, Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, you know, all that. Um, it's automatic color picture shows, robot picture shows, you know, like little robot boxes, but no boxes anymore. Um, so, okay, where does this connect with where I started? It's interesting because um, the, the um, quality of some of these experiences is such that you feel like you are connected to that, to the, to the wholeness of your experience, namely your feeling, your will, and your perception, that you really feel that wholeness of experience that is characteristic of art. Whereas others, not so. And that might interest you because that's something to live for, right? We I mean, have something to, to want to do. You know, I mean, you, you could just be inspired to want to actually bring that quality more and more through your work and the techniques of your work into society and life, period, right? And um, the, uh, this is interesting because Steiner's, uh, this is kind of like a puppet show what Steiner and Jan Schutt were working on, just to put it in, you know, traditional terms, which is appropriate, contextualize it. Um, but he wanted it to kind of go more in the direction of, I guess, shadow puppetry, where it was like pictures mm -hmm. like the cinema. But one of his most concrete indications is it would be important that the pictures were created by artists directly using instruments instead of by automated machines, which are independent of the artists. Right. And um, so, what would it look like to have a culture where we have like live performances of that of that sort, you know, like we have live music today? Um, what could it bring? Um, and I think that one of the things that inspires me and in which I'm now also, you know, kind of touching on what has already been shared is, I think materialism in its root form is simply an illusion and it's a dangerous illusion. And I think that um, there's a lot of people that feel like that. And, um, you know, to join forces, to find materiality techniques and ways that the kind of partial truths of materialism, which also cause fear and anxiety in the ways I described earlier, can be um, changed, just naturally changed, voluntarily changed by encountering art, by encountering culture. Like that's a great thing to do. <laughs> so I just, I mean, so so art as research, research as art. Or what was that it? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I really I want to say off the bat here that I've always been very suspicious of research as art. I mean art as research because I feel like the the best, like some of the best art I know comes out of this kind of um spontaneous inspiration to create. Yeah, it's just an unmediated creative urge out of the heart and spirit of a person. Out of this experience, you know, like you both of you were describing a feeling, a field of, you know, music in form or um, also color and sound. But it's like, they don't really need a justification. In fact, if they don't do art, they're going to really be unhappy. <laughs> they're not looking for a reason. And they're also not looking to distill it into knowledge. They just want to be artists. They just want to create. They want to, I mean, if we say express themselves, obviously this doesn't really work in this context, which is not good about it. One of the points is actually to kind of get to another level of expression. Um, 
But at the same time, I think it's important that artists think, you know, and think about the context of their work. And I think, you know, that of course, artists want to do that as well. You know, it's not like that. So in a way, you know, this contextualizing your work, discovering that certain substances and certain kinds of light have certain qualities, and then feeling drawn that it's important right now in a time of age, uh, fear and anxiety to work, for instance, with colored light, maybe at a snail's pace tempo, you know, very slow pace. <laughs> Why? Because you feel the necessity of it and you feel moved by it, you know? Um, yeah. So... I definitely have shared in what I just said some things that I think could be called research, just insights of experiences that I've had. But um, I think that it was largely along the path of just be trying to be an artist while, without giving up my thinking entirely. So, um, and that is, I think, all for the now. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go over there and watch you folks and you're going to talk or ask questions at least. So time to ask any or all uh, of the artists, maybe an experience or thought that grabbed you an aha or a question that's moved in your mind at this point. Join me. And I know there's a lot of artists here who could just as well be up here talking. So also just share, uh, you know, freely, I think would be great. And we could see how it goes. Mark? I've always been struck in, in your example of, um, you know, music, listening to uh, like an orchestra. I've always been struck by the separation of the artist from the observer. And that quality, I mean, much of what you just talked about as an artist is your experience of working with color and form and tone and so forth as in, in the context of like trying to create a cultural experience that is something i can't live into as the observer of your art i have a completely different experience observing it than what you've experienced creating it and so the question is i've always wondered how can that be bridged so that the process of your artistic work in a realm that I have no experience, I can experience more viscerally, more tangibly, more something. <laughs> your experience as part of the observation and even part even how bridging how do you how do I become a participant in that creative process that you go through? That's the question I've lived with for years with regards to the experience of the artist, the art, and the observer. Can I ask you a clarifying question? Yeah. So have you, so you said music with listening to orchestras? Yeah, for example, you know, live, you know, live, you mentioned live music. So if you've been at a live orchestra performance and you felt like overcome at some part of it by being moved and also the beauty of the music, you're saying that you think is different than what the artist was experiencing in creating it. In creating it. Yeah. Okay. There may be, but I don't have that. I don't need that. There may be an overlap, yeah. but I still think when I think of you know Mozart composing something and or Beethoven or Mahler or Schubert or Peter Gabriel, right. you know, let's bring some other less more less older people in. Um, there's something that they're experiencing that is different than 
my listening, my observation of it. And I want to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing that it's the same with somebody who writes a book <clears throat> that there's no way to the full experience they have writing it. Both the uh, wonderful surprises and positive experiences, but then also on the suffering struggles. <clears throat> So I don't think it necessarily has to be a total thing, but I really appreciate your <clears throat> comment because there is something less and less satisfying as an artist to simply show the work. Um, yes, it can speak for itself and people can have unexpected wonderful experiences and uh, that I don't necessarily have to know about. But I do think it's part of this cultural shift that I think I, I'm trying to see all of the negative uh, uh, attacks on our humanity today as positive opportunities. You know, what, what, how can we use this to stretch ourselves into new parts of our humanity? And so I, I do think that uh, I, I, I similarly long for a, a more living dynamic relationship between myself and other people. Um, the, the, the doing of the artistic work is largely very fulfilling, but, but there is something missing. Um, uh, and it's not just applause or a great work or I'll pay you thousands of dollars for your work. There's something else at the spiritual uh, level that um, I think that's where other people, even if it's just in questions, but, but also in, in comments, might, uh, that the artists have as much to learn from, from the viewers as the viewers might learn from the artists. I guess if I, to add to your question, I think it's a two-way uh, thing. Certainly those of us who are teachers of art, that, you know, we value teaching because we learn so much through that. And so why not also go in this other sphere? Of course, I, I'm appreciating Nathaniel's point that anything can go one side. And so there's, there's still a place for everything else that is possible and exists. So I'm not making any judgments uh, against anything, but I, I just uh, appreciate that uh, I, I also share a longing for a different relationship with my art, it's, it's more like teaching actually, not I think with, um, with, with non arts. Okay. Yeah. I just want to say that to me, um, the, the, the difference you are brought up this notion of empathy, and it's, it's just empathy, a whole landscape of empathy. So the conductor, one hopes. Or the musician in the orchestra, one hopes, is able out of hundreds of hours of empathetic living into a piece to develop closer to the experience that the composer did than maybe I will as a one off listener. I very often long in concerts for the same piece to be played twice, to have a mirror. Um, um, schedule, what's it called? Mm. Um, anyway, um, and I think it's the same meeting another human being that we often use different hooks of familiarity to help us come into empathy. And that's one of the uh, artistic virtues of our day of otherness. You know, we have ever more versions of otherness which is ever asking us to live into what did this person, why did this person make these choices or why did this person think or feel or do these things? And what can I learn by living into what could lead to that? What, what led in this human being, what led to that gesture, that creativity, that, that creation, whether it's an ugly creation or a beautiful one. So I just wanted to say that, that for me, 
living with an artist, it's always up to me, do I live with the painting as I walk by it in the stairwell? Or do I live with the painting for a while? I'm lucky enough to have a lot of choices. And when I do, new things happen. Deeper empathy, something maybe closer to the creation's experience. I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go with this. <clears throat> the question, can I know the experience that Mozart has when he creates, he composes this music? If art can be an opening a window, if the artist is successful as far as their technique can do what they want to get out there, can open a window so that I can go through the window I'm not going to have the artist's experience, but I got the open window and my experience is going to be something the artist can't have. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about the artist's experience, but I don't know that that would actually be my goal if I can really be responding to an artistic creation. I don't know, that's the best I can say about that. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I had an interesting experience this summer. You all know the Sistine Madonna, right? Painted by Raphael, the most famous painting in the world, or one of them. And um, so my brother lives in Dresden. I was visiting my brother, and I had a chance to go see the, the Sistine Madonna in Dresden. And um, big painting, glass in front of it, it's too high for the glare, you know, so all these things that are also making the viewing a little bit difficult. Nevertheless, if one takes the time to just live into the painting, and um, I've also read what Steiner has to say about it. So he talks about the knowing eyes of this Christ child and how that is different from any other Christ child that Raphael ever painted and probably most other people ever painted, this knowing gaze and so on. In the end though, what I came away with was by living into the colors, the movements, the composition, of this absolutely towering master. Um, every, every etheric stream in my whole entire being was activated like hardly I've ever hardly experienced before. Mm -hmm. Did Raphael have that intention to four or 500 years later move Martina's etheric streams? Probably not, <laughs> but um, the mastery of the combination of color, composition, movement, devotion, knowing, enlightenment, all that has creates an experience that at that moment, I can just be so unbelievably grateful for. And then the next day I went back with my sister. So first day I went with my husband, next day I went with my husband and my sister, and it wasn't the same experience. And that's okay, right? It's like, wow, you have this monumental experience one day and you look at the same painting, maybe the coffee was, you know, like <laughs> the, the way we are composed at that very moment of being receptive or not receptive is different. And it's okay to be different. And, and I think, these experiences we have, or with Brahms, or with Mozart, or whatever it is, these great masters, they were able to channel something through their creations into the artistic expression that communicates itself to us, to the spiritual um, core of who we are. And, and that's different every day, just like meditation is different every day. You can work with the same Steiner meditation for 40 years, I have done that. It's different every day, and that's awesome. And that's how I see that. It, as long as it gets you moving. Yeah. Um, I was often asked, as I saw my artist, many people say to me, the music was great, but it was really wonderful that you spoke about the music, or you brought a picture that is connected to the piece that helped us 
meet it or reach it or it reaches us in a different way. <clears throat> and I, um, I mean, for instance, for me as a, uh, a performing artist, I look at the work and I always ask myself, how should I look at it? What, what should I, um, or I would say, if you, and I mentioned it to Patrick after his exhibition two weeks ago, I long to hear what is your thought? What are your thoughts? What is the process? Why you chose blue and here you chose purple as a um, the main color in the, in the or why did you choose to do this in black and white? Or please just talk about the pieces because that will be a window for me to understand not just your process and understand them better, but it gives me then tools to understand any other piece that I see, like Laura spoke about uh, the paintings or even the picture that she gave with the poem. I'd love to hear more, but of course you have you know, you chose to give me just a picture, but I think I asked myself today as, uh, as um, I hope I can call myself an artist, what is my role or what is my responsibility today as an artist towards the, towards the world and towards others? Because I think I've been given the opportunity to have a window or develop a certain sense through my life into what I do, which I think is a great gift. But I also think that everyone, and I really mean everyone, has an opportunity to work with the arts and to work in an artistic way. And that we should, everything we, should, we do, we should do in an artistic way. Um, they will probably be less crying in the world, and, there, and, and I'm convinced that if children hold an instrument in their hands and play, they would might not choose to hold the weapon in their hands later on. So I feel that there is really a great responsibility that we have um, through the through the, the gift that we're given to reach to others. Um, but even in my little world of the sound, the world of the colors is, um, I would say, a new world. So, um, yeah, I would very much appreciate in any presentation that I am to have the possibility, and it doesn't matter if I understand what Mahler necessarily, if I can understand or I don't need to feel what Mahler felt when he wrote the symphony. And I think that's what Joe is also referring to. It's enough that I can feel my spirit or a spiritual experience or myself in a different way when I am exposed to those works of art. I think that's the beginning of uh, the gift that they can give us. Uh, I just had a thought to the speech. Um, I was really struck by listening to all of you with how different everybody was. And you were all hitting on deep truth. Nothing seemed like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Everything just made total sense, and you were all so different. And I think that that's really exciting for the time we live in is that we can be so different. That wasn't true in 15 times. The arts were sort of channeled through from the mysteries. And now we still have the mysteries, but we are all individuals. And it's this element I always ponder about and it's uh, fantasy. You know that, and I think it's an individual capacity for taking in things as we experience them, like Laura described, you know, phenomenological approach, and then still translating that to who you are into that. So I look at your paintings and I almost always can say, Oh, yeah, that's Laura, right? 
but in a good way. Right? <laughs> and and with yet with everybody. And so uh, that's just something that struck me listening here. And I think it's uh, a keynote of our time and the exciting thing about being an artist in our time. How things can come through in an individual way and still be universally true. <clears throat> I did. I, I, <laughs> um, I had a question for all of you up on the, um, in the on on the panel, um, and it's this this relationship between research, artistic research, and um, what you might consider an aesthetic experience. If those two are um, the same or really close, or if the research that you're doing in your individual work then is presented then and is experienced very differently by the audience or what have you as an aesthetic experience. I just wondered if you could just speak a little bit more about the research in your work and how you understand an aesthetic experience. So as an aesthetic experience, is that mean it's like an experience of beauty? An experience of beauty. I'm and I guess what I'm not saying is I'm just because I'm curious here in the context of anthroposophy, um, if there is an essential quality in experiencing beauty or in experiencing an aspect of the spirit or spirits in color and form and materiality. And I just wondered if you all could speak a little bit more to your own relationship to that in your work. I apologize if these are really big, big things that I'm just throwing out there. Well, I, I can say something, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if you're looking at help. Um, <laughs> if I work for a long time with colors, and doing the what I consider the research of what are these color activities? Mm -hmm. How how do they affect me? How do they interact with each other? Um, and out of that kind of conversation, um, then something manifests. Um, if so, that's one picture. Then, if a if a musician spends years developing their sensitivity to the tone, and um, then composes a piece or plays somebody else's piece with that sensitivity. <clears throat> That's a different thing. Both of those are different things than if somebody takes a, a colored substance and puts it on a piece of paper. And somebody else takes um, an instrument, which actually demonstrates it, <laughs> I don't know, in the recorder, um, and makes it make a noise. So I think it's most likely that the first two descriptions would create an aesthetic experience. Um, and the second two will it create an experience, but it might not be an aesthetic experience if you're thinking of an aesthetic as beauty. Um, because there's something between the, the particular human being and the media that comes into emotion um, through, the, through the conversation, through the working of it. And it's that motion that we experience 
as meaning and significance. And I think it's that experience that we also could say is an aesthetic experience. Um, to tie on to that, the, uh, the previous question, I think that all of that that was said about um, about experiencing, what well, can you experience what the artist experienced? All of that, I don't disagree with anything that everybody responded to that, but I do think that, and maybe this is the same as what some people said, I do think that a painting or a piece of music or any other piece of art has a job to do. It has something to do in relationship to another person who didn't make it. And that's not a job that I put into it. That's its job. And so, no, you can't, you can't feel what I felt. It's not important that you feel what I felt. You have to feel what the piece of art is saying. Mm -hmm. And that not only depends on the piece of art, but it depends on you, how well you listen and who you are, and how old you are and what else you're being faced with and all of that. Because it's like, this is streaming. Um, anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Well, um, I think that, uh, so then first to lend this question, no, I'm sorry. I think that, um, the experience of the work of art insofar as we, we just surrender ourselves to the sense expression of a, of a work of art. And I know this is just the limited approach art, but it's the one that's being talked about right now. So I'm going to just go with it. Um, I think you should have the attitude that you're accessing something that was involved in the creation of the art. And I think every artist, like the master artist, I mean, if you look at like writers right now, I mean, Marilyn Robinson, one of the most famous novelists right now in America. I mean, she thinks she's evoking certain experiences through her novels. You know, I mean, she is not like, well, I wonder what people are going to make of this. <laughs> you know? I mean, we don't have the experience that she does when she gets up every morning. She goes to a particular couch. She has her writing table. It's a ritual. And it's a very, very specific practice. We also don't experience all the madness and pain that a lot of artists go through as they do this art. Um, but if you look at also Saul Bellow, you know, one of the most famous writers in American the history of American literature, he definitely believed that the experiences of significance that were streaming through works of art were not just part of the personality. One of his biggest criticisms of intellectualism at the end of the 20th century, he has an essay called Against the Intellectuals, you know, is that no one has the courage to even just frame that thought. Now, I'm not saying that when we experience a piece of art, I mean, Martina is right on, you know, you experience a piece of art and you're having a really bad day and you're going to maybe even interpret a, a very optimistic painting somehow, <laughs> you know, in relationship to your own suffering or. I think the important thing is not to be scared of getting it wrong, but instead to have a mood of optimistic surrender. Mm. If you have a mood of optimistic surrender and participation in art, you will have experiences, and they may be totally off, but they will correct themselves with time. Mm. And I think that you know an unreflecting audience that simply comes in with optimistic surrender to a, let's just call this the modernist approach to art, which believes that through the perception of the body, you could have spiritual experiences. That's modernism, not postmodernism. That, um, that that, like that underlying belief is there, you know, in modernism. That's there. That's like actually the bedrock of it. 
And actually, you know, it's interesting with Steiner, like he was always like the most anti-artistic thing are ideas. No ideas, please. <laughs> ideas. <laughs> most unartistic thing is ideas. Like that is the thing that you have to get everything out of perception. And as soon as you start going into ideas, like it's like this gray power comes in and all the music of the world starts to kind of get in like marching lines under the universal. They're all like, yep, I'm this and I'm that. But none of them have voices anymore. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't say that part. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, have I come close to your question? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think I maybe was also touching on what Mark thought. Like, I feel like fixating on correspondence between artistic experience and the artwork actually is, it's true, but actually it didn't get us any closer to what we're looking for. You know, actually, optimistic surrender, playful optimistic participation in art. Um, you have like a lot more capacities than you might think. And even if you get it wrong, just go to sleep, wake up the next day and go again. You know, mm -hmm. it might be worse than yeah. <laughs> like go back 20 times, 30 times, every time different. Um, but you feel like you're getting somewhere, you know? Like you go back, you read a piece of literature you'd have had in 10 years, and like, man, I just ran over all of this level of this work. You know, I was just like, I was dense to that. But what you did experience is also not totally gone. If it was truly part of the sense experience, it's still also there. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I, Michael, if you wanted to, uh, I see Martina also. Or did you want to say something particularly to that? Very quick. Yeah, go. I, you know, it's like for me all now, I do find it. And it's, I always feel if through meditation, I can move myself enough to you know lift out of the normal everyday kind of person and you feel you're participating in something greater through meditation and through loosening yourself and through sensitizing yourself and through having all these fine experiences of color you were talking about all these nuanced things and then as an artist if you are like deeply moved by the process and it's not self-expression right it's no 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 you are the instrument and you are like trying to get to something more um, universal, then I always feel, well, if I move now while it's happening on the canvas or in the clay or whatever, wouldn't another person who saw that be moved because it was created through this inner movement? I mean, that's always the hope, right? And I think that's also why I had this Raphael experience. He was, of course, a deeply moved person by what he depicted. And hundreds of years later, you can pick up on that movement. And to me, that's the essence of art, really. This, this inner movement and picking up on it on both sides. I did have some thoughts, but I know some people have questions. Yeah, um, so we're really close to the end. Yeah. Um, and uh, who? Um, yeah. yeah. Mario. Okay. And then Michael, and then Tim, and then Mo. Oh, um, well, I really appreciate the, uh, the trend of this conversation. I feel we are trying to weave together a few things. So, just to the thing about research and then aesthetic experience, it seems to me at first I wasn't quite sure what to think of that term. And it's because I think it can mean different things. Uh, and while over intellectualism is the one uh, problem in, in art, the other is over uh, personal subjective sympathy and antipathy. Uh, you're just experiencing yourself if you're only liking or disliking a work of art. And beauty has to do with pleasure. Yeah, there is something pleasing. An aesthetic experience, but we certainly have to distinguish between the pleasure of I like something in a more subjective sense. You know, I like that person, as opposed to I'm knowing that person you know? and the like in the person or disliking. I'm just reacting. And that's saying something about me. So, if I just like or dislike a piece of art, 
That's not an aesthetic experience in my view. That's been saying something about myself. I think artists, as much as uh, non artists, have to school a capacity like empathy to be able to calm down, quiet one's own personal like and dislike in order to enter into the yellowness of the yellow, the blueness of the blue. That's a, a simple aesthetic experience. You know? And so then, obviously, with great works of humor, uh, that becomes much more complex, but but that's the question: Can I, as a viewer, not experience everything that the artist experience, but can I enter the realm that they enter uh, through their process? And I would say yes. And that's where I didn't quite finish the thought of a, uh, you know, about an author, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Uh, I don't know. I don't need to know all his process, but I try to enter into the thought reality or the feeling reality, uh, soul reality that he evokes through his book. And so that's where we meet. And of course, why not you have the opportunity to have a conversation and share what's similar and different about your experiences. But, but I think that's where uh, with, a, with any artist, writer, but also painters, yeah, you're touching into not the outer things of, of Raphael, but, but the, the reality that he entered through the color and his creative process. And so I would only just add that I think there will surely be great artists who maybe even to a large extent work still unconsciously. But I do think that something is shifting where the difference between the so-called professional artist and the non-professional is less and less significant. Um, even between the yeah, other professional scientists, but, but we're all science, we're all educated to think and act in so-called scientific uh, ways. And that has its positive and negative side. And I just think that we all are becoming uh, artists in the sense of developing artistic capacities at the level of feeling perception. But then of course, there's this whole realm of I don't think it out, I'm exploring, I, I can't recreate how I get to a so-called end result. It's, it's a very complicated thing, but but just like I need to learn to school my capacity to live into sound and, and discern the elements that a composer's uh, working with to enter his realm, uh, um, obviously somebody else might need to school their capacity for color and form. And, but that's where I think artists, as much as the viewer, have work to do. And so that's where the research, uh, you know, we're not talking about a dry academic research. It's because it's, it's, you've got questions and you've got to school certain capacity to come to this aesthetic experience. And uh, I think that's where we can all meet, uh, uh, no matter how much we are delve into. One discipline versus another. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so there are three people who want to share something or ask a question. And um, because of time, I think maybe if there's a question, maybe just one of you respond. And then we can um, hear everybody. Uh, so, Tim, Mario, I mean, listening to the three of you speak, it makes me realize once again that the artistic realm is, is really the human realm. We all need to become artists in the sense we need to, in your image of the holding the slushy snow in one hand, being the heart, that's what we need to do with our experiences and, and not always come with this, what was talked about also the material world that, doesn't, that leads us astray all the time. But to find that, that the human being really is an artist and must become an artist to be able to digest our, 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 who we are and, and go into the future. And, and, uh, and you really exemplified it for me today with how each of one of you spoke, but also I could feel what was behind and who you are and what your strivings are. So that's for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mariola, and also maybe with this one, right? No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, first of all, I really appreciate you bringing this type of um, event. 
And I especially appreciate the participatory part that Laura brought. And the reason that I would like to speak is that something moved in me when you moved, when you mentioned the fact that something moved in you after your experience and also your experience with Apple. The reason that I would like to bring it up is that I had an experience during the summer where I went to Albany for the immersion experience of Van Gogh. Did any of you go to see that? I think that it's a very important experience for us to have, especially since you were talking about Gilly, that you mentioned what's happening in the music that we are going to be listening, because this is something new. It hasn't been around, I would say, probably for maybe 80 years that I have been going to a concert that I hear about the piece before you were immersed in the piece, right? You went to, to listen to the music. So this immersion experience, Van Gogh, the first part, you learn about the history and his biography, and it's very well done, but you realize that all the paintings that are there are prints. And it's an amazing experience to be in this room with prints of Van Gogh, you know? So that's number one. And it somehow leaves you very empty. And then you come to this enormous room enormous room and you sit in lounge chairs okay huge room and all of a sudden paintings of van gogh are all around you moving and i would say it's probably 40 minutes okay and there is music and there are words okay and everything is moving and you see his paintings you know all around you and I was feeling very uncomfortable, but you know, you don't get up because you disturbed other people. So <laughs> I left and I was lucky I was with two other people and one of them wanted to have the experience again. So with the other one, I was able to go for a walk. And that was it. And you know, I didn't discuss it much because I was very disturbed by it. But what was very interesting was at night, I started meditating. And normally I have pretty positive experiences. And in the middle of my meditation, the swirling Van Gogh painting came in and started moving. And I have to admit, it really scared me because it really scared me. You know, it didn't stay for a long time because I managed to move it out. But I said to myself, the experience of looking at something some painting right takes time and if i really connect with it it moves me it's an inner experience it's an outer experience when i'm looking at it but it really is for me to have an inner experience mm -hmm. and even with this experience of the digital whatever it was okay something moved and i found that it's a very dangerous moment mm -hmm. in whatever we are doing right now to people to experience. People need movement. I think that they are capitalizing on the fact that the inner movement needs to happen, but the manipulation that happens in that experience was tremendous. I just want to bring it up because it's the difference what, between what we are doing here, even the simple example that you gave of the participatory moments, you know, with the sound, with color and stuff, it's not available. It's not available. Probably because that's more entertainment than an aesthetic experience. And um, yeah, tying in with that, and what Rakina said about movement is that um, having been an orchestra player and a choral singer, my experience is going to be much different from the viewer and the composer and that I'm experiencing, well, how do I come into this piece and what's my role in relating to everyone? So I'm having an oral and bodily experience all tied up with if I'm surrounded by the other voice parts of, of now this one's singing and now I'm singing with these 
it's uh, and you're not going to have that. It's an amazing social thing. This for perpetuity, I think, the artwork that was created by the composer. And Steiner said about poetry, real poetry would begin as a movement of a melodic, harmonic, rhythmic character that then becomes clothed with the words. And so when you begin to enter a piece, like for the sake of of finding out, preparing it for your rhythmy, as I'm I'm beginning to do with a new piece by Shakespeare. First, you have to find out well what is here, because the Shakespeare hasn't said, "All right, this is how you speak it. This is how you would do it in your rhythmy." You have to find that it's not somebody putting on a show for you, and so you have to find out. Well, what is the rhythmic flow here? Are there any patterns? Do certain speech sounds, vowels and consonants keep on making an appearance and how are they relating to each other? Because that then informs how the whole structure is happening. And it's just a miracle of a thing that the poet wrote it the way they did. But now you're entering it by your own labor step by step as a movement. In, in time and, and finding what, what are the telling things, like just even to discern heavy versus light syllables and where are they? And are there exceptions to a kind of pattern that seems to be set? And then how does the speech sound shore that up or carry it along and how the moods change? Objectively, leaving yourself aside, but applying your sensitivity. So anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think we should all clap. For yeah, this thank you, Gary. <laughs> and um, we didn't mention it yet, but there is um, ceramics work, as you have probably noticed, dangerously situated <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> um, this is student work from the MC Richards program and it was literally fired in the wood fire kiln two weeks ago. It's all new work. There's a couple pieces from instructors, um, but feel free to take a look around. It's really amazing. Yeah. There's, there's a little bit of on the wall. Yeah. Go back on uh, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Yes. The flyers. There's a couple of printed out the flyers here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank